Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about living a purposeful life. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Molly Wilcox. Molly is a writer from Nashville, Tennessee, who loves Jesus, mountains, poetry, pizza, her finance-obsessed husband, and her mini golden doodle puppy. Her writing has been featured in The Abide Bible, Bible Gateway, Darling Magazine, Grit and Virtue, and her first book will be coming out this year. Welcome, Molly. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Thank you. I'm excited to be talking today about living a purposeful life. And some of the things that you mention and you're trying to promote is to help us to be able to let go of some of the frivolous distractions in life and to be able to concentrate on the things that really matter. And I'm curious as to how you do that because those frivolous things just they're they're enticing. They're like, you know, you're looking at something and then squirrel, squirrel. And and you and you do other things and people forget sometimes what is important. We get so distracted by the squirrels. Yes, absolutely. I um yeah, I feel like my life was one of distraction for a long time and I just kind of got tired of it. So I was like, what practical steps can I take to actually change and live a more purposeful life? Um, and one of my favorite verses about that is, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace from 1 Corinthians. Um, I think it's 14, 33. And I just love that when we embrace a life that's a little bit more simple, I think that we get to kind of pursue that clarity that God promises and peace that he promises rather than a life of confusion and distraction where we're just kind of like, living less out of intention and more out of just like, what's the next thing that's demanding my attention or, you know, um, what's the next thing that's distracting me. And instead we get to actually invite God to be the one who directs our life and says, you know, this is what I want you to be focused on because I feel like for each of us, he has something for us. It's just a matter of us making space for it. If that makes sense. Oh, that is beautiful. Making space. I think sometimes our lives can be so busy and so filled with, I don't know, busyness that there isn't space for the things that matter. So how do you help clear out a space? What, What do you recommend? What, how do we, I love the idea of living purposefully rather than just kind of running around like a like a chicken with her head cut off where it's just we're, we're putting out fires because that happens. The things that are have a problem are what demand our attention or the squirrels. And so we're, we can find ourselves kind of just like on a treadmill where the treadmill's yeah. going really fast and we're just trying to keep up instead of feeling like we're in control. And it sounds like what you're suggesting is let's pause and put ourselves and God in control of our life so that it's peaceful. Yeah, absolutely. I think for each of us, practically, it looks different. And one thing that I think is super important is to just kind of almost take an audit of your life. And it sounds kind of like businessy or a little bit in like that productivity space of like, okay, how am I actually spending my time? And that's something that I actually started doing a while back. I was like, I'm going to track my time because I feel like I'm just going from one thing to the next and reacting rather than actually spending time on the things that I feel like God's calling me to, whether that's writing or spending time with my husband um, or planting new flowers in my garden or something um, that brings me joy and peace. So I was like, okay, I'm going to figure out first, like, how am I spending my time? What's like my day to day? And pretty quickly, I realized the things in doing that that distracted me. So for me, that's my phone for sure. That's like a top tier thing that distracts me because I see those notifications pop up and I'm immediately kind of going to like people pleasing of like, oh, someone texted me or called me like I have to answer or I have to respond um, when in reality it can wait. Um, so <laughs> most of the time, right? Um, and then same thing with just like looking at like, what do we have like excess of in our life? Like what's too much? So maybe that's For someone else, that might be TV or that might be scrolling on social media or online shopping or um, I don't know. And some of these things, they can even be good things. Like maybe they're not like sinful or bad in nature, but we just have too much of them. And I think the question that I often ask ask myself is like, where do I want to choose to have less of something so that God can give me more of something in return? And so um, that's sometimes, you know, figuring out like, okay, I'm going to commit like one night a week to date night with my husband because I really want to like make space for that. 
Um, I turn my phone off every night and I decide, you know, this is the time that I'm cutting it off. And then that's allowed me to have space instead of just scrolling before I go to bed, I'll read a book or something. And then I wait until I've spent time with the Lord in the morning to turn my phone back on again. And that's been a super great practice for me just because I'm able to actually focus on him and be attentive to what he's saying and what he wants to teach me and my Bible time rather than being like, oh, someone texted me and wants to get coffee later today. Like I should answer that first, you know? So it's kind of choosing, you know, looking at your schedule and looking at your life and figuring out what is like demanding attention of me and then asking yourself, do I want my attention to be going there? And then living a little bit more proactively rather than just being reactive. Wow. That was so much meat. Oh, yum. I have, we have <laughs> lots of things to talk about. One of the first things that you mentioned that I loved is that it's different for everybody. And I yeah. really, really appreciate that that the answer is really not a one size fits all. It's not, well, Molly's doing it right. So we're all going to do what Molly's doing or else we're not doing it right. It's right. Well, here's an example of what works for her. So let me use that and apply what is going to work for me. And I love the idea that you took a look at what was demanding your attention. And then you, you decided instead of reacted that it is demanding my attention, but I don't have to give it. Right. And so especially those notifications, I think sometimes turning notifications off on our phone is really helpful because it is that demand like, oh, you need to take care of me. It, it all of a sudden becomes a little fire you have to put out. So beautiful. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you're making time and space for your relationship with your husband. I think that is a key to having a happy marriage and to having a happy relationship and a happy life is creating space for the people that matter. Yeah, it's so true. I feel like when you actually look at how you're spending your time, sometimes it can be a little bit convicting of like, okay, does this align with my priorities? Um, even if that's time in prayer or something and you see, oh, wow, I'm only praying like five or 10 minutes a day and my priorities are like God first. So how do I change this? How do I reshape my life so that it actually reflects what I want to have priority, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, and then I think that just gives you so much space for peace and joy and even having more margin of just being like, if you do have that empty space throughout your day, whether that's time or just like time to relax, even I think God can do so much more with that because we're able to be in that place of surrender and a little bit more open handed rather than being like, oh, my entire day is packed full and I'm just reacting to whatever comes up. God's able to invite us into like this place of peace where we're able to um, really respond when he's calling, if that makes sense. Oh, that is so beautiful. And you know, I love <laughs> that idea of, of, of space and creating space and that busyness. And I recently talked to someone who had a, a heart attack. And as he was experiencing these symptoms, his first thought was, I don't have time for this. I have things I need to be doing. I've got this and this and this and this. And it's like, I will need to take care of me later. And I thought that was just such a funny knee jerk response is we're so busy that even things that are true emergencies feel like real inconveniences, you know? So I yeah, thought that absolutely. was funny. Yeah, absolutely. I think even... Yeah, when we have more margin and we're coming from that place of peace and communion and presence, then we're able to be more present with people in those situations too. So when those come up and it's like, oh, like your little sister calls and she has like a question and she's really worried about something, if you actually have the margin to be like, oh, I can I can make space and time for this. Like this is something that I want to prioritize over whatever else I'm doing. Um, but we have to be able to like take a good long look at how we're spending our time and make sure we're not just reacting, but we're able to be like, yeah, I want to I wanna be a part of this. Like, I feel like God's calling me to this right now and to be present in that current moment. Oh, I love your example of being present. And like, if your sister calls, we have so many people in the world right now who don't feel like they are seen or heard or understood yeah. because the people around them are busy and distracted. And when you gave this an example of being able to create space for someone so that if someone calls, if someone needs you, then you can be that listening ear, that soundboard, whatever the, the, the needs are at that point. And you can be, you know, an angel for them that day and just, just the thing that they need. And if we want those kinds of opportunities, I think you're absolutely right that we have to create space so that it can happen. 
Yeah, I also talk a lot about embracing our limitations. And I think that's something that our culture doesn't love right now is just the fact that we are limited. Like we only have a certain number of hours in a day. I only have so much energy. I need a coffee break, you know? And so like, I'm not God. I wasn't made to be without limits. And so I think it also starts with being like, okay, like what are my limitations? Like how much, how much time can I pour into this person or um, this situation and then kind of go from there as far as like, okay, like I want God to like help equip me through this and prepare for me to be that angel in someone's life, you know? And, um, to do that, we have to know first, like, okay, we only have 24 hours in a day and I only have this amount of like capacity for this kind of conversation or something. Um, so it starts from an awareness of that and then realizing, you know, with this, like, looking at it as more of like an empty space to asking God, like, okay, how do you want to fill this? Because I think we all can fill that and we fill it to overflowing most of the time. And we're just like, oh, here's all the distractions. Here's all the things. Like, I'll just let it fill to overflowing. And then there's no room left over for those things that might actually be the things that are most fulfilling and most like purposeful in our lives. Wow. Okay. This is, this is wisdom. (laughs) And I love that you include putting yourself and your self-care and your time and those limits. I think putting limits on things, if people would do that, that's a wonderful stress management tool to be able to recognize, okay, this is what I have to give. You can't, you can't give when you're empty. You, you can't serve right. when there's nothing there. And, and being able to say, okay, this is, this is what I have to offer today. Um, sometimes we're stretched and we actually had more than we thought we did, but having a, as a general rule, this, this is, this is where I'm at and, and learning to say no, like the phone, like we talked about distractions, how something demands our attention, but we still get to choose whether or not to answer that demand. And so putting those limits, smart girl. <laughs> Thank you. I learned all these things through, you know, a little bit of struggle. So did it wrong first and then figured out, you know, okay, how do I actually want to spend my life? Um, I love that quote too. Your how you spend your days is how you spend your life. And so I think there were multiple times in my life where I realized all my days felt like they were running together and I felt just busy and overworked and tired. And the things that I wanted to take priority in my life, like my marriage or my little sister or you know, a friend who is in need or time with the Lord, like I was like, wow, these things are just getting glossed over because I'm just answering to emails and phone. And for me, it's mostly technology. I keep using those examples. So there you go. (laughs) Well, I think that's pretty common though. I think that's what most people's distractions are because we all have a phone and they're wonderful and they can be distracting. Absolutely. And I think they often... Oftentimes, I feel like my phone will take me from a present situation and, you know, get me to look in a different direction. And sometimes that's okay. I have a lot of long distance friends and that's great. But also it's like, you don't want to miss those moments in the grocery store or something where God really has a beautiful moment of encounter for you. And you're like looking at your phone. So you miss it, you know? Totally. I love this. You know, some of the things that we're discussing reminds me a little bit of Viktor Frankl's book about man's search for meaning. And how he talked about we can get through anything, and I don't have the quote exactly right in my head, but if we have a if we have a why, if we have a meaning, then we can get through any situation. And his particular situation, of course, was, was enduring the concentration camps, which is pretty severe. Um, but I love that idea of finding value and meaning and purpose in our lives. And as we're talking, it also reminds me, I've, I've written a book about stress management, and, and part of that section is a little worksheet of how to find that purpose and meaning. And it is a lot of the things that you're describing here. We're going through and saying, what, what matters to me and how much time am I spending on it? And is, is what I say matter to me? Does that match the time that I'm putting into it? And if it does, awesome. And if it doesn't, that's where you say, oh, well, I, I thought my family was important to me and my marriage was important to me, but I, I'm spending, you know, three hours on, on Facebook and I'm spending like 10 seconds in conversation. That's when you have the chance to say, okay, let's fix this. Right. And it definitely starts with that awareness because it can be a convicting practice, but then it can also be a super affirming practice because as you make those improvements, you start to see like, oh, wow, I've been consistently like doing date night like I wanted to or something like that. And you're able to be like, this is awesome. Like my time is being spent how I want it to. And 
I mean, I definitely noticed that when I started turning my phone off at night and then not turning it back on until I had spent time in prayer because I was like, wow, like I finally figured out a way that works for me to have this focused time of prayer and reflection and meditation in the morning. And that sets the tone for my whole day. And then it's like, I get to go to those distractions that are waiting for me when I turn my phone on, but I'm in control of when I actually like engage with them rather than them interrupting something that was important for me. Um, So it can be really affirming too, because then once you see those improvements in your life, you're like, wow, like I actually am spending my days the way that I want to spend my life. Oh, that is beautiful. And that self-evaluation and being holding ourselves accountable for our time can have some of those opportunities for correction where it's like, oh, I'm really not doing as well as I should. And that can be kind of frustrating. It's like, dang it, I want everyone to, I want to be perfect. And I want to say that I've done everything perfect. And a lot of times that's not the case, but I love how you said it can be affirming where as we, as we fix and as we correct and make those corrections that we can pat ourselves on the back and say, Hey, I, I did what I said I would do. And I'm, I'm improving and I'm doing a great job. And I think we don't have to be perfect. I think we have to be making an effort in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes back to embracing the limitations too, because that's something I've had to learn is just like one of my limitations is I won't ever be perfect. (laughs) I just won't. And so that's okay. And so giving yourself permission to, you know, make mistakes and to change, like that's something that I think is so important too, because I love embracing a more simple life, but also that changes with our seasons. So for me right now, I don't have kids or anything. So I love my slow mornings and I'm just soaking it up. And my friends who are new mamas are like, sleep in while you can and enjoy that while you can, because at some point your season might change and you might not get to have that. So I think it's important to, to like, just be in that process of continual reevaluation and evaluating our journeys and our priorities, because those things shift and change too, as our seasons do. So we have to be open to you know, trying new things that work for us. And it's different for every person. So it's different for every person. And then it's also different in every season. So it's kind of this continual process of what's working, what's not working. Um, I often ask myself, like, what am I doing right now that I love? What am I doing right now that needs to change? You know, that is beautiful. So how often do you reevaluate? Or would you recommend reevaluating? Uh I feel like that's also different for everyone, but I feel like for me, I notice when I have like, um, like emotional moments, if that makes sense. So when I feel like really tired or really frustrated, like you're talking about that frustration, or maybe I feel like a sense of disappointment or like disillusionment, those are all kind of like cues to me, like, Hey, pay attention. Like what is working here and what is not working? Um, and then that's kind of where I reevaluate and I'm like, well, where do I think this is coming from? Um, so that like goes back to my phone example too, cause I noticed I am most productive also in the morning. I really love, um, to work in the morning. That's when I write the best. I am not able to write past dinner time ever. So I'm like, I need to be writing in the morning. And I realized I was constantly feeling frustrated and it was because I wasn't making progress on the things that I was supposed to be working on. And I was like, why isn't this working? And I noticed well, I've been scrolling on Instagram until like 11 a.m. So I'm not actually doing the thing that I want to be doing. So for me, that disappointment and like that constant, like, why is my to-do list so overwhelming? Like that sense of overwhelm was like, oh, this is a clue. I need to pay attention and then kind of look back on the last couple of days or weeks and figure out what was happening um, and then make the change accordingly. That is brilliant. So it's not based on a time it's based on how are you feeling? If you're feeling joyful, if you're feeling fulfilled, if you're feeling purposeful, then then you're on track. And then if something doesn't feel right, that's when you want to take a look and say, okay, where is my time? Where is my, or where can I cut back? Where can I simplify? Where can I um, make those corrections? Yeah. And I think even relationally, that's something I noticed. Like I, I'm an extrovert for sure. So I love hanging out with friends, but there's definitely, I have a limit. And so I have to kind of find that limit. So if I have a coffee date scheduled every single day of the week, I'll feel overwhelmed. And so I'm like, okay, that was for sure. Not like that didn't work. So what would work better? And I'm like, okay, actually like a coffee one day a week feels super manageable. It's super life-giving. I love having those fun conversations 
But if I schedule a couple more, then I feel like I'm not getting work done and I start to lose that sense of purpose. So it's kind of like a lot of uh, trial and error, I would say, too, of figuring out what do you have capacity for? What do you feel like is life-giving? And that's a question I ask myself, too, is like, did I feel energized after that or did I feel drained? Um, Because that often is a clue of how how that fit into my schedule and if that's something that I want to continue to make time for. Wow, I love that. That's brilliant. Finding that balance and finding those clues to help us find our balance. Because we talk about, yeah, I'd like to have balance in my life, but then it's like, well, how do I do that? So having those little self-evaluation and those those moments of reflection, that's that's really clever. Yeah, I feel like as we're talking about it, I'm like, I, it's definitely easier said than done. Um, Most things you know, are. It's, yeah, it's easier to talk about. And then in, you know, practical steps, it's a lot of just kind of trying it out and being like, okay, did that work? Did that not work? But I think, you know, being more in tune to yourself and paying attention to those emotions really helped me to figure out, okay, what what works for me, what doesn't, um, and kind of figure out like those self limits and then figure out how much space we have and how we want to fill it. And then you kind of reprioritize, which I think is really important. That is beautiful. And as we've been talking from time to time about our relationship with God, I think that that is another key element to be able to help create that balance and to help find those points is by inviting him into the mix. Because we can do lots of wonderful things on our own, but we can do so much more when we include God in the works. Absolutely. I had a mentor who I was chatting with one day and I was just telling her about my to-do list because I'm definitely a to-do list person, very old fashioned about it. I have a paper planner. I use different colored pens. It's a whole thing. And I was, you know, constantly feeling overwhelmed. And I was like, I'm just not getting my to-do list done. And she was like, Molly, what would your to-do list look like if God made it for you today? What would that look like? would it look the same as what you have in your planner or would it not? And I was like, Ooh, (laughs) like that stung a little bit because I realized pretty quickly that those things that I was like feeling overwhelmed by weren't actually things that I thought God would prioritize for me to do. And, you know, it looks different every day because sometimes it's like, yeah, the things that I'm doing, um, are going to look really productive to the world, but sometimes they won't. Sometimes God's like, Hey, I want you to like go to coffee with a friend or clean your kitchen or plant some things in your garden or whatever, because I'm going to be with you in that and, you know, provide peace and presence that's going to equip you for the next thing. So sometimes we're in seasons that are more restful and sometimes we're in seasons that are more productive or at least like appear more productive. Um, cause I think rest is productive too, but <laughs> and I love that whole concept as you're talking about what sounds impressive to the world and what sounds impressive to God and what's, and I think even, even if we're not intentionally aware, whatever we're doing is, you know, it's impressing somebody, maybe it's for myself, or maybe I'm trying to impress somebody on Facebook or so that I look cool at the next conversation thing and say, this is what I did X, Y, Z. And those things, um, I think we need to choose our audience maybe a little more carefully of, of who we're trying to impress. And like you said, when you try to do those things on your to-do list that will please God, the results are more peace and more feelings of fulfillment and joy, even though to the world, they might not look that exciting. Like if you go to coffee with your friends, that's not going to look like a huge to-do list, but who knows if that conversation was just what they needed and that, that lifting and building someone else and those creating those friendships and, and building on those, they are really the things that matter. Sometimes the things that are impressive are not the things that matter. Yes, so true. And I think in just culture right now, there's so much pressure, especially with social media and things like that, of like, oh, look what I did. Um yeah, and we want to be able to make everything like picture worthy or post worthy. But sometimes like those messy moments that God invites us into are the most important and the ones that he's really calling us to. So yeah, in order to be attentive to those moments and to be able to actually like step into them and be present in them, we have to have the space to do that. And so it's kind of going back to even like, Um, if like you're a to-do list person, like I am for me, that was like thinking, you know, before I actually make my to-do list, I 
started a new practice where I'm like, I'm going to come up with like three main goals for the week. And I try to be very prayerful about that and ask God, you know, what are these goals? Cause I do wear a lot of different hats and I know, um, a lot of people do. So, you know, what is a big goal for like my home? Like, what do I need to be doing this week for that? Or what do I need to be doing in my relationships? And then also what do I need to be doing in work and in writing? Um, and then kind of focus on those three things and then shape my to-do list around that and invite God into it. And it's also so crazy because I feel like we're so, we're a culture that's really obsessed with productivity, but the, the best way to be productive I've found is really by being with God and resting in him because out of that, we have more of like an overflow than we ever would if we continued to pack our to-do lists and pack our days. Oh, I love it. That's brilliant. <laughs> okay. And I love the idea that you didn't chuck your to-do list. You just um, added God into the mix, created more, more goals more of a, of a focus, not just a checklist. And I think as we work through those things that help us feel productive and as we move forward, it's, it's a beautiful thing and we need to be productive and we need to be doing things. Um, but again, that finding our balance and not being overwhelmed and including what, what really matters. These are good things. Yeah. I mean, it's so cool because even back in the beginning in creation, God invited us both into work and rest. And so we need both, but it's just finding the balance um, of having both and, you know, seasonally what that looks like. Um, so, yeah, it's really good. I, I just love him so much for the way he created us because I just feel like it's such a beautiful um, invitation to us to get to enjoy work and enjoy rest. And there really is joy in both. Yes. And once you find that balance and continue to like look for that balance, I feel like there's so much joy in that too, because it doesn't feel like you're, you know, being super lazy or being overworked because I mean, you could be on either end of that spectrum, but instead you find this sweet middle where it's like, God is fully present. He's equipping me for the things that I have to do and the work I have to do. And yeah, sometimes it's going to be hard and difficult work, um, but he's also needing me in rest and giving me space to take care of myself. Wow, I love that. So we're all fortunate that we have the same amount of time. Every person is gifted with the same amount of time in a day, 24 hours. So it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter whatever external forces. They're all the same thing. And then we get to choose what we do with it. And I think there's kind of a, of a upper limit and a lower limit of, of where is comfortable and too, too little, you get bored. And if there's too much, you're just busy, busy, busy. But if you can find that sweet spot in between where it's you're productive and you're happy and you're restful and you're feeling like you can, you can do something and, and you're doing something that matters. It's good. Yeah. Absolutely. I was thinking that when you said the boredom is kind of at the bottom of that spectrum, because I feel like boredom, um, I feel like I've heard this in a, in a quote or something. I don't remember the exact quote, but boredom is often a sign that we don't find value in what we're doing. And so I feel like we have to find that space where we feel purpose. So we're working hard and we're doing things that we feel purpose in, but also not reach the limit of like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed that I don't have time for what God has for me today, or I... I'm just drained and I'm not showing up as my best self. Wow. I love that. And I love things that help us be our best selves. And you've given some really good advice. Thank you for visiting with me today. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I had so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. In closing, I'd like to share a quote from Barbarella. A life without cause is a life without effect. Today, I invite you to think about what causes are important to you so that your life can have a positive effect on the people around you. See you next time on Linda's Corner.